I could have stayed, just worship, and maybe come back next year. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. God is so good. And I really want to thank Barbara very much for um, the time she took to go through my manual and highlighted some mistakes that I have. And, and also the fact that she taught so well. So thank you for that. And um, I'm still going to look at that verse. I think maybe we can use both. What do you think? I think maybe we can. So, um, you know, you never... Um, can I put this light on? Oh, wow. That's awesome. Thank you, Jesus. God is good. Amen. I like light. The more light, the better. Have we got an extra... Have you got... All of you got one? If not, that's okay. Just follow. I'm going to go as quickly as I can, but I don't want to miss out anything. I really feel we are in a prophetic time like never before. Like never before. And um, this morning or this afternoon, I was just praying and waiting on the Lord. And I just felt the Lord say to me, tell them it's time to, to prophesy over their nation. You need to start to declare things. Come on. Prophecy is a declaration and a declaring. Just don't worry about that piece of paper right there. You just, I thank you, brother, for your heart to pick it up. But tonight I want to speak about the office of the New Testament prophet. And it's such a very interesting um, topic, the office of a New Testament prophet, because we've seen so much abuse, especially with this office. And everybody's running around the country. Yesterday I heard a guy say, very, I'm not going to mention his name. I love him dearly. I think he's got an awesome ministry. But he said something and he said, well, the New Testament prophet is not called to prophesy. It's like, okay, the New Testament prophet is only there to teach others to prophesy. It's like, wow, okay. And I love him. I don't know where he got that from. But I'm telling you tonight, we need prophetic people. The, the, the anointing of Elijah is coming on the earth. Not in one man, but in a corporate setting. And so um, the office of the New Testament prophet, go with me to Ephesians. If you've got your Bibles with you, let's go to Ephesians. And let's have a look what Ephesians says. Ephesians chapter 4. I love this whole chapter because it's designed for us to understand what God is saying to the church right now. Ephesians chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles, let's go there. And um, it's, been, it's good to be back in this part of the world. I, yesterday, I twisted my ankle so bad I couldn't walk. Then God healed my ankle. And then just about 15, 20 minutes before I got you, it was like, man, I just felt overwhelmed. It was like this, all these things came on me. Like I felt like I had flu and I couldn't hardly speak. And it's like, wow, okay. So thank you for praying for me. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, it says, And his gifts were varied. He himself pointed and gave men to us, some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Notice what he says there. Some. Some will be prophetic. Some will be apostolic. Some will be teachers. Some will be pastors. Aren't you thankful that, that not all of us are pastors? Thank God you've got a great pastor and great leadership here. Everyone knows their destiny. Everybody knows their, their purpose. As previously mentioned, the Old Testament and New Testament office of a prophet is in some ways similar, and we'll go through that, yet they are different in function. We must understand, we, I'm starting to understand it's more about the way I function than the way I lead. I, I meet people that are more excited about who's following them than who, what their function is. I'm not necessarily excited about my following as I am excited about the lives that have been changed. Come on, let's get that down there. I'm more interested to see what's happening in terms of your ministry. Who are you changing? Who's coming to the Lord? Who's been discipled than just the following? Because if you get the presence of Jesus in the house, you'll have a following. Because they'll come for Him. Amen? And not for you. And so... The Old Testament prophetic office was mainly for the guidance of the people who did not have the Spirit of God resident in them and therefore had no way of knowing the will and direction of God. That's why God needed a voice on the earth so that He could speak through these men. The office of an Old Testament prophet, prophet, prophet was also for correction. How many of you know that those guys were pretty tough? Didn't muck around with an Old Testament prophet. When they came to town, you took your spring vacation. 
reproof and the instruction. But the problem is modern day prophets want to act like Old Testament prophets. Don't need to do that. Reproof and the instruction in the ways and thoughts of God. The office of a New Testament prophet is given so that the body of Christ may be perfected in order to effectively function. God is interested that the church functions like heaven on earth. Amen. And I'm thankful that I have a that I have pastors in my life, that I have teachers in my life. I'm thankful for apostolic men. I'm thanking, I'm thank God for prophets. But I'm telling you, God is more interested how the church is perfected, how the church matures, how the church um, functions. Amen. Come on. And fulfill their part in the building of the entire body of Christ. I'm excited about that. Ephesians 4, 11. Let's go read a little bit more. It says that it might. So he gives us these amazing gifts. It says his intention was the perfecting and the full equipping. Just underline that word perfecting in your Bible. Some Bibles omit that word. Some Bibles don't even have the word perfecting. Some Bibles don't even have the word equipping. My Bible says his intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints. That word equipping in the Greek, when you go and study the Greek, that word equip does not mean I come and give you a toolbox. That means, in, in the Greek, it means those fivefold ministries are responsible in healing a fracture in the church. It actually means in Greek to heal a fractured bone. So that prophetic guy speaking over your life, if he's a prophet of God, is more interested, rather than just to give you a generic word, who you're going to marry, he's more interested in giving you a word that will heal you, bring you into relationship with God. Amen. Come on. So that you can become whole in the implementation and the expression of heaven. There are too many people in church, not healed, not whole, not mature. They still, tech, is that the right word, technon? Technon, the Hebrew word or the Greek word for, for teenagers, technon. Is that right, Josh? Help me here. Technon. Technon. Who, who knows their Greek? Technon. So there's a lot of teenage Christians in church, all of them being technons. And some of you are sitting here saying, I'm, I'm 50, but really you're a technon. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get teenagers to run and do the things in the kingdom. And God says they haven't matured to become sons and mothers yet. And that's why we need the prophetic in the house. So that they can draw you into that place of maturity. Isn't that amazing? That's an amazing word right there. So if we are to recognize the ministry of a pastor and evangelist in the body, we must also recognize the office of the prophet. And I, and I, and I think I said this last time. You know, we're very polite to call Pastor Steve pastor. But really, in, when you look at his ministry and the things that they're doing in this church, I personally believe, and I could be wrong, that there's more apostolic on him. But we're so happy with pastor. Because it's easy, it's, it's a generic word. But really, we need to start recognize what people are. It's very important. When I'm around my staff, when I'm around our churches and the, the churches that I've planted, I have never said one time to my pastors, call me apostle. They just do it because that's what they want me to be to them. So when somebody walks up and says, I notice on your life you're a prophet, what they're actually saying indirectly is that's what I want you to be for me. I want you to be a prophet to me. I want you to prophesy over me. Come on, don't be, don't be, don't be concerned when people start calling you things that they want you to be. Come on, church. We get, so, we get into spiritual pride and, spirit and false humility and all that type of stuff. So we need to recognize and I'm not big for titles now. Believe me. I'm, my card says David MacDonald. You, you won't see on my card Dr. Reverend Prophet Apostle MacDonald. So I'm not into all that stuff. I'm into function. So let's find the church and let's find out how we can get you to function beyond the hurt, beyond the wounds, beyond the fractures of your life and bring you into your destiny through the healing. Amen? Come on. If the church can just get healed, we'll get the job done. We spend thousands of hours, man hours, counseling, and there's nothing wrong with counseling, but sometimes those counseling sessions go on beyond the expiry date. Instead of just giving them a word. Now, you speak, I'm, I'm speaking prophetically now. Amen. Uh, when I had our church, and by the way, it's so good to travel with my son, Daniel. He's here tonight. But I remember back in Australia, my, I never counseled. They said, Pastor David, you are banned from the counseling sessions. Because my counseling sessions were like one minute long. Read the Bible. So, okay. So, um, 
so let me read this again. So we, if we are to recognize the ministry of past and evangelist in the body, we must also recognize the office of the prophet for each has a part to play in the perfecting of the saints. And this work will continue until Jesus comes back. Amen. As we begin, uh, as we be in this office, we'll however, see, we will, however, we'll see the similarities between Old Testament and New Testament prophets. The, the New Testament prophet is given by Jesus and he's called and called out ministry. That's what it says in Ephesians 4, 7. It says, um, yet grace, God's unmerited favor was given to each of us individually, but in different ways in proportion to the measure of Christ's rich and bounteous gift. So it's a called out ministry by Jesus. It is not something we strive to achieve, but something we are called to. Amen. If you're called to it, you're called to it. You cannot apply for a job as a prophet. You cannot do that. And I meet people that say, can you give me a job? I, I want to be your next. No, you, it's a call. Amen. And, and also all the other gifts are a call. It's a commission. So the New Testament prophet is given by Jesus. 1 Corinthians 12, 29. Let's go there real quickly. I'm going to read as many scriptures as I can tonight so that you guys can see as much as you can in, in what I'm saying. 1 Corinthians 12, 29. 1 Corinthians 12, 29 says this. It says this. It says, So God has appointed some in the church, first to be apostles, second prophets, third teachers what are those three called those three are called governmental officers they are the government amen then wonder workers then those who, with ability to heal the sick helpers administrators in different tongues are all apostles are all prophets are all teachers do all have the power of performing miracles do all possess extraordinary powers of healing do all speak with tongues do all interpret but earnestly desire and zealously cultivate and the greatest and best gift and graces and yet i will show you still a more excellent way uh, and by that is and then he says uh, one that is better by far and the highest of them all love so everything that we do needs to be built on the platform of compassion platform of love but he's asking a very important thing here are all prophets no we're not all prophets that's why there's a diversity in the kingdom of god amen speaks about that about the whole body being an eye the whole body being the mouth the whole body being whatever it is no we're not you know my body consists of different functions and i'm thankful for god amen and so um however paul does say that all may operate in the function of prophecy we may all operate in the function of prophetic ministry not the office of, of a prophet so all of us sitting under the sound of my voice may move into the spirit of prophecy and the office and and the gift of prophecy amen the gift of prophecy and the spirit of prophecy just say that the gift of prophecy the gift of prophecy and the spirit of prophecy what is the spirit of prophecy the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of jesus amen then he comes by the holy spirit and he gives to you a resident gift if you woke me up at two o'clock in the morning five o'clock in the morning any time during the day and said can you come and pray for somebody prophetically that gift is resident within me and i will operate in my gift amen and all of us need to aspire that. I, I think many times the church thinks, oh, well, I just want one gift and just give me the gift of healing. No, I'm telling you, start to ask God for, for as many as possible. I'm starting to understand we have to be people that are multifunctional in the kingdom. Multifunctional. Amen. And so... Um, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 and 31, we see this office and function distinguished in Acts 20, uh, 21, 8 and 11. So some of them were moving in the prophetic. Some of them were moved in the office of prophecy. But Acts 21, we see here that Philip, that, that piece of paper, just leave that piece of paper there, please. Acts 21, that piece of paper wants to be on the ground. It's it just, yeah, it's just happy. Acts 21. Let's read a couple of verses. Acts 21, it's verse 8, it says, On the morrow we left there and came to Caesarea and went into the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, who, and we stayed with him. And by the way, he was the first deacon, part of the first deacons of the, of the church. And he had four maiden daughters who had the gift of prophecy. Isn't it amazing they weren't evangelists? But they operate in the gift of prophecy, which is an amazing thing. Then we see, a, a, then we see, then, and then it says here, while we were remaining there for some time, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. 
So yeah, we see people with the gift of prophecy. And then they speak about this guy, Agabus, who was a prophet. And it says, uh, then we see a prophet named Agabus appear on the scene. He was not prophesying, but merely telling of what the Holy Spirit said. We see him again in Acts 11.28, where he's foretelling concerning a drought. Let's go to Acts 11.28 quickly. And let's see what this guy speaks. He's not prophesying out of a spirit of prophecy. Yeah, he's, he's operating in the governmental authority of a prophet. Also read something the other day where somebody was saying that prophets don't bring a word of, 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 um, of uh, um, warning. Of course they do. Why are we downsizing the prophet? I'll tell you why. Because we've seen such miserable examples. We've seen the church absolutely slapped around by people that think they're prophets and there's no accountability anywhere. And now the pendulum has swung so far left that nobody wants to hear anything about what the prophet says. The prophets are there to speak the word of the Lord, to bring a warning. I would love to know that. That there's a warning. God's speaking amongst the prophets. There's a warning coming. I remember some prophet came to Australia and prophesied that the nation was going to be swept over by, by a, 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 like a cyclone, a hurricane. And I'm telling you, man, we prayed. And we said, no, if he came and said, look, there's, there's a hurricane coming, be prepared, pray, it's different. But he said the whole of the nation will be destroyed. And we got up there like a week before the hurricane came. It was one of the biggest hurricanes that ever hit Australia. And we prophesied over that thing. I said, you will not kill anything. You, all you'll be is you'll be a big storm. That's all you'll be. No deaths, nothing. In actual fact, when it hit the country, it was the biggest. It was like an F5 hurricane. When it hit the country, the only thing that happened is a woman gave birth. <laughs> Woo! So Acts 11 verse 28 says this. <clears throat> and one of them, it says, And during these days, prophets... Teachers and interpreters of the wine, will, and purpose came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Say prophets. Say it again. Prophets. Prophets in the New Testament came down. They come on. They came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and prophesied through the Holy Spirit that a great and severe famine would come upon the whole world. And this did occur during the reign of Claudius. So it didn't happen the next week. It happened some time later. So the disciples resolved to send relief, each according to his individual ability, in proportion as he had prospered to the brethren who lived in Judea. And so they did, sending their contributions to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Why? Because this prophet had spoken a warning over an area. Amen? Come on. Why are we afraid of that type of prophetic ministry? Because we've seen so much nonsense. And I believe God is recreating, healing, and restoring back to the church credible, strong prophets that move in the spirit of prophecy. And they're there to build into the bride. They're there to adorn the bride. They're not there to smash her around. And I believe there's going to be a, a group of men God's raising up that be, will be apostolic. They'll be strong to be able to come into agreement, into relationship. Amen. Come on. I'm in relationship with awesome, awesome men of God. My apostle that I call apostle is Pastor Cheyenne. He's my apostle. Brian Simmons is my apostle. Those are the men that I hang with. Those are the men that I'm accountable with. In actual when I leave here tonight, I'll write Che a little message and say, I was at this church. This is what's happening. Blah, 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 blah. Because he likes to know. Hello? And the day is coming where guys like myself aren't traveling on our own. That's why I'm bringing this young man with me. Because I believe on his life, there is a supernatural Daniel anointing. And I want him to pick some things up in the spiritual realm. He's my Timothy. He's my, not only my blood son, but he's my spiritual son. Amen? Come on. Okay, so we know the function. We know that the function of prophecy is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yet the office of the prophet must include these gifts. If someone comes to me and says, I move in the office of a prophet, I want to see some things beyond him just being able to give a prophecy. I want to look for the word of wisdom. In other words, the supernatural insight of knowing by divine revelation how to deal with and what to say in a situation. Word of wisdom. This deals with the future. Supernatural. Say supernatural. The word of wisdom. All operating out of the one person's office. The word of knowledge. 
the supernatural gift of knowing about a situation in someone's physical and emotional areas and their circumstances deals more about the past than the present. I was at a church on Friday, Saturday, Friday night. We started a school in Long Island and I just ministered and boy, God, there was a lady sitting there and I said, you've been battling with pain in your body for 11 years. And boy, she just broke down and started to weep and God healed her and touched her. It was amazing what God was doing. The discerning of spirits, the supernatural insight into the realm of spirit, both, both angelic and demonic, and to see motives and attitudes of the human spirit. That's another area that we divert from because we've seen all the messes. And what we've done has been, there's been such a, you know, just everybody's got a demon. And then we have people on demon hunts. Excuse me. There's none of you here in this room, get, believe me, that has a demon. Thank you, Jesus. Aren't you happy about that? Maybe your husband thinks you has one, or maybe you think your wife's got one, but let me, let me assure you there's none here that have demonic stuff on your life. You've been covered and washed by the blood of Jesus. Come on. And what happens is we go around looking for them. Oh, I can see. You've been eating too much lobster. You must have a life. I've been there. I've been in those meetings where people called me out and said, Oh, well, you, I see that you've got a lobster demon on your life. It's like, what does a lobster demon look like? Well, you eat too much lobster. And don't you know that lobster eat all sorts of nonsense un under the sea? And you've got a coffee demon. And you've got a... I said, the guy said to me, Have you watched Pink Panther? I said, Yes. He says, You've got a Pink Panther demon. That's why we must hear these teachings, get mature, and start to realize what we're dealing with. The greatest desire of daddy in heaven is to see you fulfill your destiny. See you healed, see you restored, see you loved. Amen. Come on. So all these things should be happening. Prophets also tend to move in the utterance of the spirit also. Prophecy, the function of edification, exhortation, and comfort to the body. So not only does the prophet, the guy that works, walks in that governmental authority, and you'll just see it on their life. Not only does he know how to pro move as a prophet, but he can prophesy. Hopefully. It's like uh, if someone said to you, I have a gift of healing and everybody I've prayed for died, then obviously you don't have a gift of healing. If so if you come to me and tell me you have a gift of prophecy and you can't prophesy, we're going to have to talk about that. That's why I, I, I can't agree with this man last night that said, if you're a prophet, the New Testament prophet's um, purpose is not to prophesy. And I'm, I, I'm sorry. Tongues. How many of you believe that tongues is very, very important? Now, let me just say this. We had a guy in Africa raise somebody from the dead and he couldn't speak in tongues. <laughs> Come on. We put so much around tongues. Is tongues bad? No. Tongues good. Tongues awesome. It's a gift. I love my spiritual language. But I'm not going to build a, de a denomination and I'm personally not going to build some doctrine around tongues. I'm personally not going to do that. I've learned my lesson when people have said, you know, I don't speak in tongues, but, you know, we've seen six people a year, deaf ears, open eyes, blind, you know, people coming in, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people getting saved. But, I, you know, I just love Jesus. It's like, whoa, that's enough for me. Amen. But the operation of a message in tongues differing from the believer's personal prayer language. In other words, if somebody speaks in tongues, is their interpretation. And so all these things come into play. Hopefully, if you're operating in the office of a prophet, that you can actually interpret what was said in the Spirit. Okay. And you see the church has walked away from those amazing um, um, supernatural abilities that He's given the church. God's given us amazing things to operate in the New Testament church. He's given us His Holy Spirit. He's opened up the supernatural realm. Every time I drive onto this island, like God just says, open heaven. Whew. Did, I mean, I don't know if Daniel will tell you, but when we drove on to Long Island, it's like there was a different sense over this island. There's not, listen, listen to me. There is not as much aggravation in the heavenly realm over this island as you have in your heart. Sometimes we have more aggravation going on inside of us and God's looking over this island and says, I've just given you an open portal. Whatever you desire as a church, just bring it on. Just receive it from me and walk in your power and in your destiny. Amen. Come on. God wants you to operate in your anointing. God wants to operate, have you operate in the purposes of heaven. 
Amen. Come on. What is your name? Ed and Sherry. Listen to me. You have an amazing gift to teach. You need to stir that up. It's a gift of a teacher, an anointing to teach. And it's like you, you know how to, you know how to um, uh, measure the scales. It's like everything has to line up. Everything is like the counting anointing on your life is amazing. Everything you see is detail. Amen. Come on. So you need to understand why God's given you that spirit of excellence and understanding. It's like you have a Daniel anointing on your lives. There's some of you sitting over here thinking, oh, well, I'm just bad. No, you're not bad. You're an awesome, natural, supernatural thing. You're beautiful. Amen. Come on. You're beautiful. He wants you to know that. Amen. Come on. People are seeking to be told how beautiful they are. When I met my wife, I told her, you ugly looking thing. I never did that in one second. I said, you're the most beautiful thing I've ever met. And two weeks later, I proposed to her. And now we've been married almost 30 years. Something worked. But can you imagine if I walked up to her and said, jeez, you ugly. <laughs> and that's what we do with the church. And then we can't understand why the church doesn't love herself. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. However, it should also be pointed out that any spirit-filled believer, you can underline this, any spirit-filled believer may operate in any of those gifts and not be a prophet. But these particular gifts are certainly in operation with the office of a prophet. But remember what I said in, what, remember what Barbara taught, chapter 4 and 5, what I taught in chapter 3, there is a protocol, and one of the protocols is character. Don't forget the character bit. That character has got more to do with your life than the gift. The office of a prophet is more inclined to function also in the area of visions and prophetic dreams because of the insight ability that goes with the office. I can't explain it to you why I have such amazing dreams. It's nothing that I do. I just go to bed at night and I wake up and during the night I have all these amazing dreams. The other night I dreamed three dreams like one after each other. It was like a movie. It was like movie night with Jesus. And the Lord showed me an amazing thing, Pastor Steve. The last dream that I had was the most amazing out of all of them. Because on a bicycle was a young woman. Um, she was riding this bicycle. And as I grabbed the bicycle, he said, I want you to grab the youth of this generation. I want you to grab hold of this youth. For I am bringing to this nation a youth revolution like never seen before. Don't let them go. Hang on to them and bring them in. Because she was on a bicycle. And the bicycle represented her purpose and her vision. But she needed to be steered in the right way. Don't let your young people go in their own way. As we have seen, the hallmark of this office is to know things supernaturally. Just say that. Know things supernaturally. Know things supernaturally. Know things supernaturally. Lord Jesus, I thank you that we'll start to hear the frequency of heaven. When you started playing on your piano or on your keyboard, where's that brother? Let me tell you, you started unleashing and opening up a supernatural realm. When you blew the shofar, I want to tell you something opened up in the spiritual realm. Don't ever think that you're just playing your piano. I'm telling you, every time you hit a key, it, it's a signature sound in heaven. And God responds to it like, like, like this. So we see this functioning in the Old Testament office as well as the New Testament office. However, in the Old Testament, we see that the giving of direction normally accompanied this, whereas in the, not so in the New Testament office of a prophet. Let me, read, let me read to you what I mean. 1 Samuel 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. Verse 20. How many know this is an amazing story? I've done a series on this whole story about when Saul went and looked for the donkeys. And he was so focused on the donkey that he almost missed his destiny. But on his journey of looking, after the do looking for the donkeys, he met Samuel the prophet. Now listen to this. It says, Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Because it says here in verse 18, When Saul came near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, where is the seer's house? Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today and tomorrow, and I'll let, 
let you go and will tell you what is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be thinking about them, for they are found. And for whom are all the desirable things of Israel? Are they not for you and for all your father's house? When I read that, I, I want to tell you, it, it's, it's an amazing example. I believe there's an opportunity, I think, personally. I think there's an opportunity. And if we consider the fact that God's a supernatural God, I believe that anything can happen and it probably will. That's just, that's just how I feel. Amen? And so I believe I'm from this persuasion that if it's written in the Bible once or twice, it could happen again. It's got to do with our faith. Amen? Come on. And so um, we have to understand that everything we do as prophetic people, as prophets, as the fivefold ministry, we need to operate out of a very clear spiritual platform. That we're not just moving by what the flesh sees. That we're not just moving by what we feel in the flesh. Because many times I can feel certain things, but it's not God. So I have to really discern, is this God speaking to me? Come on. Especially when you prophesy over people to have children. In the last couple of months, since I've last seen you, we've had three women since I've last year. And now there's 19. In total, there's 19 women um, that were medically declared barren in our ministry that now have children. 19. In the last uh, year, three of them fell pregnant. In actual fact, I prophesied to a, a girl in February when I was in Australia. When I got back in September, she came waddling to the church. It was barren. Examples, prophet Agabus. Let's look again at prophet Agabus, a Acts 21.8. Let's go there quickly. Acts 21. We must discern these things, people. Must discern how this operates. Must discern it. Acts 21. Is, how many of you believe God's word or God's spirit within you is creative? How many of you believe that? Put your hands up. How many of you believe the spirit of God within you is creative? then start to realize that you can walk around with the creativeness of God in you. You'll never create a tree. That's already done. So don't walk up to your fish pond and start speaking. I want perch. I want man. Well, who says it can't happen? But I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is don't be weird. But we can create the atmosphere of faith and we can operate to call those things that are not as if they are. And I'm starting to understand that stretches my human capacity and faculty to understand God's mind and heart. Come on. When a woman says, here's the information, I could not fall pregnant for so many years. There is the medical report. Something happens to your head. Wow, maybe I'm wrong. And then you start a minister to her. And then nine months later, she gives birth. What happened there? We crossed from natural thinking into supernatural thinking. We crossed from natural faith to supernatural faith. Something happened in that realm, and I can't explain to you what it is. All I can say is I got a word, and I spoke it by faith with great um, anticipation, with power, and something was released into that person's life that caused her to fall pregnant. Amen? So let's read this Acts 21. Verse 8, it says, On the morrow we left there, came to Caesarea, and went into the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. And he had four maiden daughters who had the gift of prophecy. While we were remaining there for some time, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to see us, he took Paul's belt with it and bound his own feet and hands and said, This says the Holy Spirit. This says the Holy Spirit. The Jews at Jerusalem will bind this like this, the man who owns this belt, and they shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, both we and the residents of that place pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul replied, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart like this? For I hold myself in readiness not only to be arrested and bound and imprisoned at Jerusalem, but also to die in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he had not yielded to our persuading, we stopped urging him, saying, the Lord's will be done. And so, yeah, we see Agabus foretelling what would happen to Paul. This was a personal word for Paul. God's, God brings a word of prophecy to an individual, but it is wrong to seek this for guidance. Now, I'm going to speak about that later on, maybe tomorrow night. 
and should be used only, used only to confirm that which the Holy Spirit has already been prompted in our hearts about. In this situation, Agabus did not try to tell Paul what to do or go to Jerusalem. All he did was he released the word. That's all he did. And so, Acts 23.11, let's go there. Acts 23.11. It says, um, I'll, 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 okay, it says, In that time, a, a following night, the Lord stood beside Paul and said, Take courage, Paul, for as you have borne faithful witness concerning me at Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Now, when daylight came, the Jews formed a plot and, and bound themselves by an oath and under a curse, neither to drink until they had done away with Paul. And um, in actual fact, God chose to use the prophet to prepare Paul for what lay ahead. The pleading of the people in verse 12 was not part of the prophecy given by Agabus. Any prophet who endeavors to control people's lives through their office is in grave, grave danger and gross deception. And that's what's been happening. So what we do is we give somebody a word and then we try and control their life. Control their lives. I've seen it happen. Some guy will give you a word and then the next thing the guy starts to control you and manipulate you because he's given you this word. Now he wants to micromanage the word. That's not my job. My calling is to release the word and let the Holy Spirit help you amongst your leadership. It's all about leadership helping you to do what you need to do by the Spirit of God. Don't even come and ask the prophet. Listen to me. When a, if you have a mail, um, the mailman, you call him a mailman or a postman? A male person? I know there's a lot of males, but not a lot of men. Okay, so let's call him postman. So if the postman came to your house, knocked on your door, said, Mr. Um, Ryder, we, is it Ryder or Ryder? Ryder, I have a package for you. But you know what? I just did, I took the liberty and I went into your package. And you got a pudding, you got all sorts of stuff from your grandmother living in Iceland, but I just thought I'd go through your package. I don't think you'll be happy about that. But what we do is we receive a word from a prophet and then we expect him to have gone through the package. I don't read your mail before you get the envelope. He gives you an envelope and you should be able to determine and discern the, the information. So don't come to prophets and say, what did you mean when you told me that? I don't know what I meant. I just spoke the word I got. Because that prophet's probably going to be tired. He's, he wants to get back to his room. He's gone from a happy prophet to a tired prophet. And then you come along and stand right in front of him. Most times even with your bad breath. And you say, I want to know what the word of the Lord is. And the guy says, okay, I'll tell you. And starts to rumble off a whole lot of junk that he doesn't even know where he's getting it from. And then you get confused. Don't ever do that. Take that prophecy, get it to someone to write it down, get the scribe to write it down, get it to your leaders and say, guys, what do you think? There's, there's wisdom in a multitude of, of leaders. Amen? There's wisdom and safety. So listen, if the, if the guy was totally off the wall, maybe it'll be a good time to confront him somewhere in the hallways of the church. And say, hey, I, I don't think that was from the Lord. Maybe let your leaders do it. But at the end of the day, let the guy go and rest. And if he comes back refreshed in the morning, say, you know, by the way, um, is it okay if you, if you could discern that for me? I don't, I don't know how to discern that and do it in a civil way. I think that's more appropriate. Amen? Is that okay? I don't know why I said all that, but I felt I needed to. Okay. So, the pleading of the people in verse 12 was not part of the prophecy given by Agus. Any prophet who endeavors to control people's lives through their office is in grand danger of gross deception. Um, Acts 11, we have a similar situation. Agabus is foretelling of the famine, but it was not the compassion of the people's hearts that led them to gather this. Uh, but it was the compassion. So, a a Agabus is foretelling the famine. Remember we spoke about the famine? But it was the compassion of the disciples' hearts that led them to gather the, and send relief. He spoke the word, it touched their hearts, they became compassionate, and they responded. Amen? Acts 13, 1-4. Let's see what it says there. Are you guys okay? It says, now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets. Hallelujah. I love it when I read stuff. It says, inspired interpreters of the will and purposes of God. And teachers, Barnabas, there was Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a member of the court of Herod, 
the tech right and saw. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Separate now for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they put their hands on them and sent them away. So then being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia from the, that port they sailed away to Cyprus. In other words, once again we see God revealing himself through the office of the prophet. Barnabas and Paul had just returned from Jerusalem and were obviously seeking God for confirmation as to the next direction of ministry. The word came through the prophet that God desired to use them. Yet it was the Holy Spirit that gave them direction, verse 4, as to where to go. Amen. So we must understand a very, very important aspect and principle of everything that we do in the supernatural. The Holy Spirit is the guide. The Holy Spirit is the gift. The Holy Spirit is the one that activates. The Holy Spirit brings it to pass. That's why we need to incline our ears and our spirit. When we are moving in the realm of the spirit, you need to have a healthy spiritual life. Healthy. You can't wake up in the morning and go, let's put on Fox television. People, you know, I can't tell you how many people call me. Who's going to win the Senate, the Senate, the seats? God cares. But I tell you right now, I'm not getting into that. Amen. I'm not getting into all that stuff. God hasn't told me to speak anything about it. He hasn't told me a thing about it. Not a thing. I've been like praying and saying, okay, God, show me. Nothing. It's not coming over my windscreen right now. The biggest trap for these that operate in the office of a prophet and those who follow them is to become performance-centered. And I've seen it so many times. So we're not going to perform. We're not going to have a little circus act, prophetic act. The the prophet comes in and acts and does all these things, rants and raves and throws his Bible around and sweats and spits and all that. We're not going to do that. We're going to wait on the Lord and say, God, what do you want to do to activate in these people's lives a desire to become more like Jesus? What do you want to do in this church to make... Tonight when I was praying, the Lord said, Your church is a lighthouse. It'll cast its light to the north, the south, the east, and the west. Great ministries will come out of this house. You must understand, this is an aircraft carrier. This is not a British bus on a tour in London. Amen? Have, have you ever been in London on one of those t- red buses? None of you. It's an amazing op- thing. It's great. Okay, those that operate in this office sometimes rely on their gifts and fail to base their ministry on the Word of God. I have to know the Word. can't just go to the gifts. I have to understand what God's saying. I have to study this Word. Then they feel obligated to perform, and this leads to take over by the, by the flesh. The gifts that accompany this office are operated as the Spirit wills. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 12, 1. I mean 11. And these gifts, achievements, abilities are inspired and brought to pass by one and the same Holy Spirit. You know what I've started to read again? Good morning, Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, you need to start to read that again. Find anything you can. But that book, you know, I read it years and years ago. I mean, I must have been about 19 or 20 years old when I read that book. And I found it the other day on my bookshelf, pulled it out. And started to read it and it made more sense to me today than it did all those years ago. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Because I was was somewhere in my journey and I need to share this. I was trained and told you can't speak to the Holy Spirit like this. You can't say to him, oh, you know, you just, I love you, Holy Spirit. I praise you. I was told you can't, you can't praise the Holy Spirit. I was told that. And now I'm reading this book and I'm starting to see I can I can speak to him. I can. And it's become exciting. Come on. Those that, fo- that follow get, get caught up in looking for guidance through this office and forget that the Holy Spirit has been given to, them, uh, given to guide them individually. Man is not there to guide you. The Holy Spirit is. Man has been delegated to help you, to show you, to reveal truths to you. But they're not there to, you know, that's why some people drank Kool-Aid down there in South America. 900 people drank Kool-Aid. Because they followed some guy. They, they, the Holy Spirit was null and void in that whole arena. That's why we need a combination. We need a corporate move of God in the, in the church in this day. A, a, the move of the Holy Spirit. Like never before. Amen. Come on. 
so that we know what has been spoken, so we know that we can follow. I can, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Let me tell you. And so it's important that when people are prophesying over your life, that they're actually getting the information from Jesus, from the Holy Spirit, that heaven is in, a, in agreement with what they're saying. Is that okay? Do not be misled into thinking that, that everybody who calls himself or herself a prophet is actually one. In other words, every one of us sitting here tonight has a track record. You can go and Google me. I'm famous. I'm on Google. And you can go and phone everyone I'm in relationship with. I give you permission to do that. And what we don't do is we don't realize that um, there's thousands of people out there calling themselves prophets. Why do you think we have such a big um, problem with false prophets? Why do you think that? Who can tell me? Because the true ones haven't got up yet. And until the true prophets of God, true apostles, true pastors, Ephesians 4, pastors and the prophets, and those guys get up and start to speak of the, the thing of the Lord, we're not going to see, we're going to see these guys run around and do their stuff. Amen? Come on. What this scripture is really saying is that whenever the Holy Spirit is in manifestation, it will always make Jesus Lord. It does not attract attention to any function of man. That's why when I finish ministering, I don't want to be the center of attention. I want to get in my car and go. I don't want to hang around. Because I know people. People will come and they'll try and make you feel good. And that's just nice. But man, I want to get out of there. I want to get back to where I'm staying. So I can get out of the sight realm. Amen. And I'm just telling you the truth. I don't want to hang around. And I mean, people came up to me the other day and said, Can you sign my Bible? And can you sign? I said, No, I don't like to do that. Okay. What this scripture is really saying is that whenever the Holy Spirit is in manifestation, it will always make Jesus Lord. It does not attract attention. Does the manifestation within the person bring glory to Jesus? Amen. Come on. 1 Corinthians 12.3. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians 12.3. It says this. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit of God can ever say, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can really say, Jesus is my Lord, except by and under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? 1 Corinthians 14.3. Listen to what it says here. But on the other hand, the one who prophesies, who interprets the divine will and purpose in inspired preaching and teaching, speaks to men for their upbuilding, and constructive spiritual progress. Say spiritual progress. Say it again. Spiritual progress. Progress. I'm starting to understand your accent. Progress. And encouragement and consolation. So there's not just edifying, exhortation and comfort. There's another word that they put in there called spiritual progress. What does that mean? It means I want to make sure that you've actually on your journey, you're on your journey and we're going to monitor your journey to f make sure that you started at A and you're going, to, you're going to end at Z. We're not just going to come along and pamper you and grace you and tell you how much we love you. That's good. But we also want to make sure as prophetic people that we actually continue, have you continue along the timeline of God so that you can fulfill your destiny. Come on, if you were building a house on the island and you gave that contractor a million bucks and said, build me a house, and he said, okay, and you said, okay, when are you going to start? I'm going to start on the 1st of May and I'm going to be finished by the end of August. You'd be happy having a nice house, a million bucks, gave it to the guy. But you get there at the end of August and all he had done was the foundations. You're not going to be happy. But that's what happens. And so that's what prophets are called to do. We are called to come alongside the leadership and help and say, okay, we've got a group of people. I want to see you fulfill your destiny, what's happening in your life. And then we speak words of confirmation and affirmation over your life. It's like little words that come and help you wire and put together all the wiring of God. And then we flick the switch and we carry you on into your journey. And then two years from now, you're preaching and teaching and doing all the stuff you're called to do. That's progress. But what we want to do is we just want the prophet to come in and say, Oh, I know who you're going to marry. 
And God will, sh- and, and we start prophesying generic nonsense over people's lives, and everybody in the church says, oh, I got a word. The prophet told me where I lived. If you don't know where you live by now, honey, we got a problem. I went to a church the other day. They said, Are you going to tell us when our birthdays are? I said, This is called Russian roulette. I'm not playing that game. And so what we've done, according to Hebrews chapter 3, I think it's Hebrews 3, it's we have given people milk instead of meat. And that's why we still have teenagers in the church. We need some prophets to come to town to speak the word over your life that ignites things in you. Tells you some stuff that you know only you and God knew. Brings you that place of personal conviction cry out to God. That's what happened to me all those years ago, 1987, just after I got married. A woman came to our church, prophesied over me. Janet Brand, I'll never forget her name. I went home and told my wife, there was a false prophet at church and she was a woman. And this woman prophesied everything I'm doing now. And for two, three weeks after that, all I could do was lie on the floor and weep and weep and weep because the word she spoke activated and ignited in me a personal conviction to draw close to God. And the closer I got to my daddy, the more I realized how filthy and stinky I was. That's what prophecy does. So does the manifestation within this person bring glory to Jesus? Does it, bless, does it bring blessing to you? Do you feel encouraged? Do you feel lifted up? Amen? This lady sitting right here, what's your name? Terry? The, I just see a word over you, and the word is because you've been faithful, and it's like you've been knocking on heaven's door, and I just see this amazing thing opening over you. And God releasing new wine and new peace and new joy. And the word over you is restoration. This year and next year will be a year of restoration. Because you've sought God. You've, God, I want more of you. And as you step into that place of healing and restoration, God says, I'm going to touch your family. I'm going to restore your family. I'm going to heal hearts. I'm going to restore family. I'm going to restore family. I'm going to restore family. And by December this year, you're going to see a whole lot of chairs that were empty last year filled. In Jesus' name. Now you can go home and check that one, Daddy. Does it bring them nearer to God? When you got a word, did it bring you near to God or did you run from God? A person does not get saved one day and function in the office the next. The difference between prophecy and, and the office of a prophet is probably 30 years. Hello. There are too many people running around. I come out of Bible school. Oh, what are you doing? I'm a prophet of the Lord. When did you finish Bible school? Last year. It's like, wow, that's amazing. Have you ever been to Brook Cherith? What's Brook Cherith? Well, that you didn't answer the question. That means you don't understand. Because if you want to move in the office of a prophet, one of the first things God will do is He will take you to your place of cutting. You can speak to any leader, any prophet, any guy that's doing what he's called to do and is the value of God. You'll find that this guy spent time in that place called Brook Cherith. That's where God tests you. That's where God tries you. A person does not get saved one day and function in the office the next. It takes a period of a development of many years and will often have functioned in a lesser dimension of preaching, teaching and spiritual gift manifestations before ever being set apart for this ministry. I say to young men and young women all the time, don't be impatient. I'm right now dealing with a young man that I love dearly. He's traveled with me. What he did was he went off, couldn't wait, went off and got his degree in theology, which I think is wonderful. Now he came back and says, oh, Pastor David, um, I, I've got a, you need to give me a position. Not going to work like that. You need to serve the house. Come and serve with me. Come and walk with me. Come and, come and journey with me. Come and battle with me. Okay, let's fight some things together. Come on, let's deal with some Goliaths together. I want to see how you bleed. Everybody just wants to be in ministry. People don't understand that in ministry you bleed. (laughs) Come on. 
I'm not interested in how big your gift is. I'm interested in how big your character is. Show me your character and then we can talk gift. I'm strong in that stuff. Very strong. Prophets will operate in the gifts of healing also. Certainly in the laying on of hands, but also by the spoken prophetic word without the laying on of hands. Example, you can go to 2 Kings chapter 5. Let's go and show you something. I've been just recently, where was I? Oh yes, I was in, like this lady on Friday night, but I was in Australia in September and I said to a guy sitting there, listen to this. This is 2 Kings chapter 5. How many of you know what happened in 2 Kings chapter 5? What happened there? Who is, who is this guy that was speaking about you? Naaman, the commander of the, of, the, of the army of the king of Syria. What did he have? Measles? No, he had leprosy. Can you, be in a, can, you be in, can you imagine being married to a guy with leprosy? Every time you gave him a kiss, he could lose his lips. But anyway, yeah, the prophet did not lay hands on him. What did the prophet do? The prophet sent his servant. That's like me coming here to do this thing and I, we're having a prophetic conference and I just sent Daniel. I said, Daniel, you go down to that church. I've got the word. You've got the word in you. You go and tell them. I'm sitting in my room and you come and tell them what they need to do. That's what happened there. And, this, and the servant goes down there and this guy gets up and says, I thought the prophet would come and wave his hands and spit on me and give me a white hanky and anoint my face. But, and this guy, Naaman, almost loses his healing. So let me tell you what happened in Australia. Yeah, I'm standing there preaching and the guy sitting over there, I said, you sitting over there, God is going to touch your kidneys. The whole church went ballistic because the Monday morning he was going in to find out what else they could do for him because he was on dialysis. And when I spoke to him, I'm telling you, the fire of God came out of my hands, went into his body. He fell on the ground and said, I don't know what's happening to me, but fire's on me. That Monday, he went back to the hospital and they said, we don't know what you've done, but your kidneys are totally healed. Amen. Never even touched the guy. Never even touched him. So what we need to do is we need to package this with a far greater sense of faith. Then just thinking, I have to just have a word. I had a man that I used to travel with years and years ago. I remember we'd go through the city and I'd say, look, I'm going to go and pray for this person. And he was from another country and he traveled with me. And I'd say, come and, come and pray with me. I'm going to lay hands. He says, no, I'm not a healer. I'm just going to sit in the car. And that bothered me for years. And now when God says, go and lay hands on them, it's like God gives you that interpretation prophetically to know what to pray for. And I've seen more people healed in the last five years of our ministry than in, in the last 30 years of our ministry. And it's awesome. Prophetic anointing. Whew. And you know, it's amazing. In the round kidneys, I, that's that, like the fifth person that we've seen get healed um, on, in their kidneys. It's like God has a kidney ministry. Babies and kidneys. Lord, I pray that, okay, I'm, as I was about to say, everyone that's expecting a child, just put your hand up. Nobody here? Okay. They're not ready, that's for sure. Okay, no, I, just, I do that at meetings. If you're wanting to child and you've been trusting God for a child, I thought this lady was going to put her hand up. I've seen grandmas give birth. Don't worry. In Africa, a lot of grandmas give birth. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> like 80-year-old ladies walking around giving birth. Okay, these situations came about because of a specific, listen to this now, I want you to see what I'm written here. Because of a sudden inspiration from God. Sudden inspiration. <laughs> suddenly worshiping, suddenly. <laughs> like, wow. God says, yes, I don't want to tell you everything I do. I want people to be um, surprised what I do. Don't always think, um, you know, it's, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, and the Holy Spirit's like a wind, just blows where it wills. Isn't it amazing? We try and put the, the Holy Spirit in the box. It says there will be times of sudden inspiration from God about a given situation and the method of dealing with it. Amen. Come on. Certainly the prophet would function in the gift of faith and miracles also. I've learned in my, in my life, if you don't put a voice to your faith, you aren't going to see the results. You're not going to see the results. You know what I did today? I could, you, you can ask my son. I could not walk on my foot today. 
Last night I couldn't walk from Penn, from the top of Penn Station down to the right to the to where we got. I could not walk. And what I did I, last night when I got into bed, I started speaking to my foot. You will be healed. You will be healed in the name of Jesus. Blind Bartimaeus, let me tell you, they couldn't shut the guy up. And some of you people have told you, don't you shout, don't you be so radical, don't you this, don't you this, don't you that. And you're sitting there, you need a healing, and you've been shut up by mediocrity and, and fear and doubt from everybody else. You need to start hollering and shouting out to the Lord. And start to put faith, a voice, start to take your voice and cover your faith with your voice and start to speak to the mountain. It's a, it's a form of prophecy. Speak to it. I speak to it in the name of Jesus. I speak to that airline. I speak to it. Amen. I was sitting at the airport. I need to share this stuff with you because unless we hear testimonies, we, we just think this is, oh, this is good stuff, you know, and maybe it'll work. Listen to me. There are testimonies. These things are happening on a week-to-week, day-to-day basis. I was sitting at Atlanta Airport. I was going to, I looked, the Lord said, look on the screen. And I looked and my plane that I was going to take out was going to be delayed. Nobody else saw it. So I quickly ran down to the Delta counter. And I said, I, but before that, I said to the Lord, Lord, you know, I'm flying from Atlanta all the way back to Maui. God, could I please go in first class? I mean, these are the discussions I have with God. Lord, you know, <laughs> I'm your favorite son. Do you ever say that to God, like, God loves me more? Somebody got upset with me the other day when I said to a church, I said, it's not my fault God loves me more. I got a call from a guy in the church. He was upset. It's like, give me a break. Get a life, man. Listen, anyway, I went up to the counter and I said to the lady, I said, uh, good morning. I said, how are you doing? She said, I'm blessed. I said, that's fantastic. Before I could say anything else, this is what she said. She said, can you teach me about healing? It's like, I want to fly home. She said, yes, can you tell me about how God heals? It's like, whoa. I said, yes. And we started to talk about, you know, Matthew and Mark and Luke and how Jesus went about healing those that were oppressed and Jesus. And how. He, and she, next thing she brings her Bible out of her handbag. There's a queue a mile long behind me. And I'm saying, I want to go home. She started to talk about Jesus. Never told her I was a pastor. All I did was, good morning, how are you doing? The Spirit of God came on her and touched me. And so, yeah, we're talking about Jesus and how God heals. And she says, oh, by the way, Mr. McDonald, where are you flying to? I said, I'm flying back to Maui, Hawaii. She said, I'm flying you back first class. Jesus. What happened? I, I spoke that in the, into this atmosphere of faith. Amen. Because when I look around this room, I see women and men of God. Men and women of God that are ready to do great exploits for Him. Great exploits. The only thing with that is that you need to come and lay it at your apostles' feet. And not try and start a ministry outside of the realm of faith and ministry and leadership in this house. My son is a dreamer. He's got the most amazing supernatural creative ministry your word for him was right on daniel lives in 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 hollywood he's studying and aspiring to be an actor he's been faithful to go to acting school in hollywood has the most amazing dreams about stuff wants to see stuff happen you're right he sees things from a different perspective when you go to a movie with daniel you don't go and watch the movie you go and study the credits afterwards it's like wow okay it's like when you watch a movie with Daniel, you enjoy it. Listen, when I went and watched the movie um, um, Transformer, Transformers, it was a whole new movie when I watched it with Daniel. Listen to me. There's some of you sitting here with great 
aspirations and dreams and desires and anointings. And some of you said, this is what some of you have said. We have been around church too long. I don't think we'll ever be used. I don't think we'll, we'll never be, go out here. We'll never be this. I'm just happy with what I have. I'm just content for Jesus to take me home. You need to stop speaking that stuff over your life. And you need to start to get into alignment with God. Find out what your church needs. Get into every department within the church. Find out where you fit in terms of the prayer meetings. Listen to me. All of us should be part of the prayer meeting. I just pray multiplication over your prayer meetings. Come on. Not always the usual five or six or ten women in your prayer meeting, but hundreds of people locked into God because they want to draw the things of God down onto earth. Amen. We start prophesying over this nation. This nation is a godly nation. Okay, say miracles. We see from this that there is an office that cannot be fulfilled without a good deal of maturity and spiritual development in our Christian lives. The prophet does not know all things at all times. Please don't come and ask me where you're having breakfast tomorrow morning. I don't have a clue. He knows the things that God chooses to reveal. We see an example of this with Elisha and the Shumanite woman. 2 Kings 4.27. I'm not going to go and read it. You can go and read it. He said, the Lord has hidden it from me. He had to ask his servant, what does this woman need? And his servant said, she needs a baby. Well, what happened with the whole prophetic thing that says you shouldn't know before you prophesy? That, just, that whole thing just went out the window right there. Because he heard what her need was. But he spoke right into her need and created in her the ability to give birth supernaturally. Hello? Isn't that awesome? She's excited about that. We, we, oh, don't tell me anything about everyone. Yeah, you can tell me about all sorts of people in your church. And I've come to understand something. Maybe when you speak to me, God will just connect something to my spirit. The prophet, Elijah the prophet said, you have hidden it from me. Why do you think he did that? This is my opinion. I believe he wanted her to speak it by faith. But she never did. What did she say? I'm self-sufficient. Thank you very much. I go to the charismatic church down the road. I'm on the worship team. I'm married to a pastor. I'm happy and I'm content. Really? And he says to his servant, what does she need? He says, she, they need a child in this house. Something needs to happen. Yeah. They need an inheritor. They need an heir. And then he prophesies. This time next year, you're going to be pregnant. She says, Master, don't lie to me. <laughs> Come on. Don't, make, don't get my hopes up. Well, guess what happened? <laughs> and then what happens? All hell breaks loose. What does she do with the child? She doesn't go and take him to the mortuary. What does she do? Takes him to the proper sh proper prophet's chamber. Let's, and, let's, and when the prophet says, how are you doing? She says, all is well. But she's hanging. There's a dead kid on her donkey. See, I can preach on that. Some of you have got dead dreams and dead aspirations and dead stuff and dead ministries hanging on your donkey. Instead of bringing that stuff back to the altar of God and bring it to his attention, say, God, you said. Come on. You said, I love it when Daniel's a little strong with me. Dad, you didn't do this right, or you can do this better. It's like, whoa, I like that. I act all dumb. I say, okay, Daniel. But I love it when he's assertive. Come on, Dad, Dad doesn't mind if we're assertive. Just get assertive tonight. Get assertive this week. Don't just allow every little thing that comes along to steal your joy. Get assertive. Say, God, I'm in this for the long haul. I'm in this to see your kingdom come. I want to see Jamaica touched. I want to see all those islands touched. I want to see revival break out. I'm, I want to see Haiti, come on, come into revival. I'm not sending thousands of dollars to Africa so they can buy food. I'm sending all that money so we can train leaders so we can see Africa come into a place of revival. And I'm prophesying over those people. I'm not teaching this stuff because I have nothing else to do. I'm teaching this stuff so the church can become alive to what she has. You have the Holy Spirit. We need to fall in love with Him. 
and start to declare by faith those things that God has put inside of us. He said the Lord has hidden it from me. This observation makes it obvious that you cannot just go to the prophet anytime and say, give me a word. It is only as God leads. Now I said something just now that may even sound contradictory, but if you woke me up at 2 o'clock in the morning and you said, give me a word, I'll certainly pray in tongues. And I'll wait on the Lord. Amen. And God may give you a word, but you must remember the prophet only prophesies in part. He only prophesies through a window, uh, it says, through a glass darkly. In other words, can you imagine if you painted the mother's room and you couldn't see both ways, but there were little pieces in that room you could still see through. That's what it means. You don't see the whole picture. You just see little glimpses. Amen? Okay, we've got 20 minutes to go into the motivational gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is speaking about somebody that may not be right in the office of the prophet, but moves in a, in a place of motivation. When you're around them, they're always motivational. They're full of life, full of excitement. How many of you have met people like that? It's like they, they, they're just always excited. It's like the music starts and they're like kangaroos. They just, you know, they can be in a prayer meeting. It's like their battery doesn't run dry. It's like they've got this motivational thing. Romans 12.6. Let's go to Romans 12.6. I'm going to say this clearly. The gift is speaking of a person that does not fulfill the office of a prophet yet. But you're in that in-between stage. How many of you know that there's a process in everything God does? Chapter 12, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 6, it says, Having gifts, faculties, talents, qualities that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. His, gift, his whose gift is prophecy, let him prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. And those whose gift is practical serving, let him give himself to serving. He who exhorts, he who encourages, he who contributes. Um, and so it goes on. But, it, but it, this is speaking about the fact that there is a motivational gift. We're motivated to do it. We love to wash people's feet. You're just motivated. And I think that's one of the things. Can I just say this? And please spit out the bones and swallow the meat. But can I just say this? Do not grow tired in doing good. Don't grow tired. I don't. I know there's some of you that have been part of this beautiful church for a long, long time. Don't grow tired. It's an amazing test me and legacy when you meet people that can say I've been part of a church 30 years or I've been part of the church 40 years that's an awesome thing but I've noticed sometimes the church grows tired and we always seem to be looking but never receiving and I personally believe this is prophetic I'm speaking to you prophetically now I believe we've entered into the most supernatural age the church can be alive that's number one number two I believe the most powerful motivational anointing is coming on the church and we're going to see people arise and do things in the next couple of months of their life that we thought was going to take 20 years it's going to take two weeks i'm telling you god's going to speed some stuff up he's going to multiply we i'm, I'm telling you we're going to see it the greatest harvest of souls is coming in I was in Australia. We saw in the, in, the, like in the first couple of weeks I was there, we saw 56 people saved like that. And we weren't even having altar calls. I was just saying, you over there, you want to get saved? Yes, Psst, crying. You want to get saved? Yeah. People were being called out of the auditorium to be saved, out of the seating. I'm telling you, God's going to start to do that. I had a young guy of 18, Caleb, that traveled with me to Australia for seven weeks. This guy was prophesying. I was like, whoa. He traveled with me to Africa last year. This young guy came out of jail, out of a fantastic home. Parents loved God, good home, good church, good everything. But him and his friends got a little drunk on beer. And they went down to the school, found the school open and stole some lollies. And in Georgia, it's a federal offense. And the boy that he was with was so scared, he told his dad and his dad called the police. So yeah, this young man who gets locked up in jail, spent the night in jail. His father bailed him out. I met with him a week later and you could see, man, this guy is not a crook. He's not a criminal. He's just a young 17-year-old that need a good 
wake up call. And so his lawyer called me and said, look, they're going to look at his, his stuff. Would you take him to Africa? I said, absolutely, I'll take. So that, that, they went back to the judge. And I'm sharing this with you because God can change someone's life. If we give them an opportunity, so he, long story short, he came with me to Africa last year. And I'm going to tell you, the first week, it was very difficult for him. More so for him than for me. But after three or four weeks in Africa, he was a little different. Came back, started a revival amongst the church he was in. A revival broke out. This year, he went with me to Australia. The guy has prophesied. Prophesied. It's like, wow. Just because of an opportunity. And some of you sitting here tonight, I believe that you're going to start to come into a place where you're going to see motivational giftings come on you. You're going to feel motivated. You're going to be drawn back to your first love like never before. I'm telling you, for this stuff to work, you're going to have to be in love. For this stuff yet to operate, you're going to have to be totally in love. You're going to have to get into first love again. I'm, I'm smitten by the Lord. You know, um, worship is not just four songs on the overhead projector. But I'm going to sing to him love songs like never before. Do you think so? Do you think the church is going to fall in love? I think so. Some of you are already falling in love. Some of you have been in love for a long time. Okay, so the gift is speaking of a person that does not fulfill the office of a prophet, but has a life motivational uh, gift of prophecy. And when I read this, some of you are going to start to identify with that. That's what usually happens. It speaks of a person who is outstanding and marked by the ability to see. The one who has spiritual insight. I'm always excited when I'm around people that come to me and say, Pastor David, I saw this in the spirit. I saw this. That's good. That's not bad. But if you're seeing demons all the time in the spirit, that's not good. I've never seen a demon in my life. God showed me angels, shows me heaven, shows me Jesus, shows me the kingdom, and I've never seen a demon. I'm not focused on hell. I'm focused on heaven. I'm always a little suspicious when people are telling me they can see all sorts of stuff. It's like, okay, change your focus. Because the devil would love you to get so focused on him that you lose your ability to see Jesus. And I know that this is pretty controversial, what I'm about to say, but it's okay. I can handle, I can handle it. When I got saved, I did not read a book on hell. I read the book on heaven. It was the goodness and the love of Jesus that brought me into the kingdom. Not a book about hell. I'm going to tell you that. So we need to correct our focus. Okay. This would be more correctly interpreted as the gift of insight. Say insight. This particular phase of prophecy is not a foretelling function, nor is it a foretelling function, but a gift of insight that is given to certain people as are the gifts of serving, teaching, motivation, exhortation, contributing, leadership, and mercy. God has endowed certain people with an ability to perceive. How many of you ever felt that I perceive something in the spirit? They are very spiritual, perceptive people. Amen. They're always drawing. How many? Where's that lady that drew here last time I was here? She, she drew and she was amazing. And there's some people here that draw and they do things and they have a spiritual perception. And, and it's like they're very arty and a little eccentric. Okay. Prophets that fill the ministry office of a prophet have these attributes also. But this seems to be a, a perhaps a lesser dimension of the scope of prophecy. These people have a more direct, listen to this, or fine-tuned sense about where people and things really are at. This is what distinguishes them. They are able to discern and sense the inner motives of people in a way that others cannot. I know people like that. My wife. She can walk up to him and say, I, you know, I know you, I've, I've seen that you're speaking to this person. Just be careful. I'm saying, you're so harsh on them. She says, no, just be careful. Because this is what I perceive. And 99.999% she's right. Amen. Not like us. Yesterday in New York, I was looking for Peking Duck. So we walked into a restaurant, sat down, and the guy gave us the, the menus. And I said, do you have Peking duck? He said, no. So we got up and left. That wasn't prophetic. I just, I needed Peking duck. Amen. How many of you love Peking duck? Man, and we searched all over for Peking duck, didn't we? And we found Peking duck. Hallelujah. 
We didn't find it in Little Italy. We found it in Chinatown. Okay, just want to tell you. <laughs> These people have a more direct or fine-tuned sense about where people and things really are. The basic tendency is to view people in light of their life before Christ and not from this various front and mask that people wear. How many of you know a lot of people come to church like they're going to a, a mime or a ball, a pantomime? You know what a pantomime is? A pantomime is where you go to a ball and you dress up. You have a mask. Nobody can see. What do you guys call it? A masked ball. A masquerade. Whoa, I like that. See, so a lot of people come with their little masquerade. And, and prophetic people or this type of gift goes through and looks through that masquerade, looks through the mask, looks through all the stuff. Come on. They tend to be able to see through this, especially with reference to right or wrong and respect to moral standards. And what they need to do, if you feel that you fit into this category, what you need to do is ask God for more grace, more mercy, more grace, more love, more patience, more kindness. Amen. Come on. Because if you have this amazing motivational gift of prophecy, our tendency is to uncover. Well, I'm just going to uncover that guy. I can see it on, you know, I've been in that place. I, I remember going to a church and there's some people sitting in front of me and I knew they weren't um, women, they were men, but they were dressed up like women. Now I'm sitting, a young prophet, the blue-eyed boy, and my first impulse was, I am going to dob them in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make it horrible for them. So I went up to my pastor and say, I pushed my chest down and say, you know, I know some things, pastor. Those people sitting over there then and started. And you know what he said to me? He said, go and sit down and you pray for them. Let God do it. Amen. Come on. We're not, listen, prophets are not God's policemen. These people with this life motivation of prophecy are often well able to move and speak in the spirit perhaps more fluently than others. Every spirit a full believer can function in this gift, but these people tend to find it easier to do so. So there is a process where you'll move from just moving prophetically to a place where you just feel such a, an urgency. And you're in that process of being matured. And that's why we need to watch our motive and how we function in this gift of motivational, in the motivational gifts of the Holy Spirit. Be cautious, you know, be kind. Amen. It's like I've learned that, you know, God's given us an amazing radar system called the Holy Spirit. But I also learned, you know, there are purposes and, and there are plans why God does certain things. Amen. Come on. Now, now, I do remember this. When I was in Houston, Texas a number of years ago, God showed me a guy sitting right in the front row. God said, you need to take that guy to the office and speak to him with the pastor. So after the meeting was over, I said to the pastor, Pastor, this man needs to go with us to the office. So we went into the pastor's office, closed the door, and the Lord revealed some things about this man to the pastor in front of the man. And at first he got very upset. He told me he was going to sue me. And, and I said, well, brother, this is what the Lord showed. And I told him again, the second time he fell on the floor and repented. Now, if I'd done that in public, how much, how little it would have um, actually blessed him or touched him. He would have probably never come back to church. We need to understand, you know, don't be so vigorously obsessed with your prophetic anointing. Be a little sensitive. You know, I've learned, of, I've seen prophets activate and do all sorts of stuff in public and you cringe in your seat. It's like, whoa. I don't think Jesus would have done it that way. Let's be sensitive. Amen? Because there's none of us here that, can't, that cannot um, cast the first stone. That can. All of us can't. We can't. We can't cast the first stone. Cannot do it. Cannot. Cannot cast the first stone. Cannot. Cannot. Say cannot. Will not. Not even if I'm tempted. Not if I even know the inward things going on in the life. I will not cast that stone. Come on, church. If we can learn that, if we can overcome that temptation of casting the first stone, I'm telling you, God will use us. But we carry barrels of rocks around with us, and everything we see, we just want to cast, you know, well, I know your, I know your background. 
I know where you come from. How can God use you? Come on, church. And so praise God. Okay. Do we need the motivational gift? Absolutely. Do we need people with insight and um, uh, perception? Absolutely. The life motivation of prophecy. John the Baptist fulfilled the office of an Old Testament prophet and it's said that he, he that it is said to be the greatest of these prophets. However, when we view the detail of his, of his life recorded in Luke 3, 3 to 20 and Matthew 3, 1 to 12 and John 3, 22 to 36, we see many characteristics that relate to, to this life um, motivation of prophecy as well as others who have this gift. John the Baptist came dressed in camel hair, Matthew 3, 4. This depicts the kind of ministry that these people fulfill within the body. I know people like that. They just come just plain Jane, boy. Totally humble. I know a guy like that called Colin Tucker. You can ask Daniel. Humble guy. But boy, when he starts to prophesy, it's like, whoa. And we've had to teach him. Now he has a ministry of absolute love. He has a love ministry now. When the life motivation people sense a person's inner motives, they come out with a frontline approach. <laughs> okay. It takes courage to do this, yet God has given them this ability. That is why they function in it according to the measure of their faith. How many of you know it's good to have a frontline approach? I'd rather have a frontline approach than trying to make people feel that they're not going to go to hell if they don't receive Jesus. Come on, you can warn people and tell people how lovely they are. And, and I'm speaking about unbelievers, but there comes a time where you have to tell them the truth. And sometimes it takes that frontline approach. Amen? These people have a, listen to this, these people have a moral courage to uncover sin and unrighteousness in others. People normally view them as too stuck at times because of this directness and frankness they have. It has a tendency to disturb people. Sometimes they can be misjudged as being negative. They have a great difficulty in correcting or preventing themselves from this frontal attack on the wrongs of life. They're very strong. They're very strong. That's why, listen to me, it's so important to travel in a team with other men that can compensate that. Compensate. My wife is my con compensator. She brings that, comp she compensates for my directness. I'm very direct. I want to... Get in the right in there. And he says, no, just remember to love on them. Give them some sugar. Okay. Now, when I'm dealing with some stuff, there's times I don't give them sugar. I give them castor oil. Amen. Get it out of you. Okay. John the Baptist was actually acutely aware of this human unworthiness. These people have a keen sense of being, with, being nothing without Christ and will openly admit it. They may even want others to point out their blind spots and tend to be very hard on themselves. And what this takes, it takes maturity. It takes other people to come around and mature them and help them. Amen. Come on. Otherwise, listen to me. If we find people in this, in this stage where they're all motivation and there's a lot of strength and we don't help to undergird them and help them, they will burn out. They will crash and burn. Come on. We see we need balance in everything with God. If they cannot find the capacity to do this, they will then feel unfulfilled knowing that they can never call others to op be open and honest. They want to see others honest and open. That was my big thing. When I first started in ministry, I wanted to meet people that were honest and open. And what happened to me was I thought everybody was a sheep. <laughs> I thought everybody in church was a sheep, but they're not. There's a lot of goats in church. And prophetic people want to find that connection point where they can be honest and open and they can confide. That's what they desire. And if we can't find that, the biggest danger of prophets is that they will draw away from people and become individuals like hermits. That's the worst thing. Find your village. Find your tribe. Find your fit. John knew he was only a voice of God and depended on spiritual, scriptural truth to validate his authority. These people know that if God does not operate this gift through them, they would not have any chance of survival. Others may be able to rely on their training, education, or study, but the prophetic motivation people feel they can not, never rely on this and are totally dependent upon God for the inspiration and demonstration of His power through His Word to cause them to function correctly. That needs to be the under, undergirding part of every foundational part of your ministry, that you are totally dependent on God. 
totally dependent on, on the Holy Spirit. Amen. John the Baptist was very direct and frank in his speech. Many other people would never talk like this, but this, these people must. Now, can I just say this? These people must, but at the same time, there needs to be some type of covering. So when they speak with strength and they're very, you know, in your face, there needs to be grace as well. I'm not just giving people license here that you can walk around just, you know, blowing steam off people or on people. John said to the multitude, you brood of vipers. Now, I believe there was, there's going to be a time that God's going to have to speak that stuff to, to people out there that aren't listening or aren't doing the things that God wants to do. Come on. I can't wait for the prophets to rise up and speak on national television. I'm telling you, man, I'm tired of just seeing Christian television. We need to get on Fox. We need to be on CNN. We need to be on MTV. We need to be on every other thing and speak prophetically. Come on. Okay, that's just my little pet peeve at the moment. Repent and get right with God. Their motivation is to bring others face to face with themselves and their sin. They see things as either black or white. How many of you know that when you speak a word of prophecy, most times and every time I've seen the Holy Spirit convicts of sin? Very seldom do we have to go and point somebody's sin out. But there's, there's a measure of grace for us to do that as well. Amen? Come on. I mean, if, if listen... It, if somebody calls your donkey four days in a row, go and buy a saddle. I mean, if somebody says to you that, hey, you know what, get rid of this stuff, get rid of this stuff. I mean, what's it going to take? What's it going to take? If you're not convicted by somebody using love and, and purpose, what's it going to take? It's going to take the truth. But it's the way we do it. How do we administrate that? The reason why I'm speaking about this because I've seen too many wonderful, great, awesome men and women of God bleeding unnecessarily because they were told all about their sin, but they weren't given a res they weren't given uh, um, they weren't given uh, the grace to say, well, this is how God can do it. Sin alone will hurt you. If I came and told you all about your sin, but I never told you what God did on the cross, that'll hurt you. Do you understand? There needs to be balance now balance God has equipped these people now listen to this John said every tree therefore does that does not heal fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire these people will chop you off at the ground with their honesty about what they see in you there are sh no shades of gray in them amen come on three different groups of people came to him for advice and he told them straight no beating around the bush I think we're in another we're in another era but at the same time there's leverage here that we can operate like that if need be but I think the first um, course of action is grace and mercy. Amen? God has equipped these people. How many of you know that Jesus knew when he picked Judas? How many of you, how many of you know that you think you know or you think Jesus knew that he knew who, who he was picking? Don't you think Jesus knew that guy had long fingers? Don't you think Jesus knew that he was going to be the, the, the betrayer? Of course he knew. And sometimes in my own life, people have come through my life, come into my life, come into my frame of life. And God said, all I want you to do is love them. And I knew they were going to betray me. And it was a test for me, not for them. I'm telling you. And many times I failed it terribly because halfway through the journey, I just got on them and said, I... You know, and then God said, that's not what I wanted you to do. I want you to learn something out of this. I wanted them to see me in you, but now they couldn't. They just saw you. Those people that don't love you aren't there, to, there because the devil sent them. Many times it's because God wants to see where you're at. I knew I wouldn't get a big amen on that, but it happens. Amen. God has equipped these people in this way. They are vital in the body of Christ. If they were not there, many people would find themselves excusing their sin and never really being confronted about it. John preached repentance. These people are motivated towards seeing repentance and an owning of the issues. Life motivation people find themselves fulfilled in doing this. They place a great emphasis on the right and wrong and have a capacity to identify evil. Just a couple of more paragraphs and then we're going to end. They have the courage to open reprove evil. They have no trouble handling confrontations. Herod and his wife and John put, had John put in prison because of this gift and capacity to see and reprove evil. This guy went to jail, man. 
He didn't just say, oh, well, you're a nice king. He said, hey, king, you, this is what going to happen. He rebuked the king. John was able to discern people's motives. Luke 3, 15 to 17. These people have this ability and insight. It's like they have x-ray eyes and have a motive, discerner, and tenor in operation. These people are but not but reasoning in their hearts. We see Jesus doing this in the ministry also. Amen? Is that okay? Okay, so... When, when these people speak the truth to an individual, they don't see themselves in their mind as talking to that person, but to the truth. You see, that's the great motivation behind this. You're not speaking to the person, you're speaking to the thing behind the person. But they need to know that. Amen? When we are spoken to by these people, we need to remember that it's not necessarily directed at us personally, but to the situation we have ourselves in. Herod and his wife did not see it that way. These people also need to train themselves to remain patient and not become intolerant of others or irritable at their lack of change. Don't be irritated by people. I used to get very irritated with people. You know what I used to get irritated with? I used to get irritated with kids. Can I just be a little bit transparent with you? I'm telling you, man, at church, I used to think, oh boy, I hope all the kids are in some children's church locked away in the dungeons of the church. And, and one day, I started pastoring my own church. And to my surprise, I actually had children in my church. It's like, oh, Lord Jesus. And one day, a little boy of about three years old was playing with a ball at the back of the church. And we had a wooden floor, and that ball went poing, 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 and came and sat by right next to the pulpit. And the whole church went, because oh, they knew Pastor David, that he was going to a fuse was going to go pow. and that little boy walked down there and he was about this high blonde eye blonde chubby cheeked blue eyed little cherub and you know what he did no he came and stood next to me and grabbed my hand and God set me free set me free and I'm telling you that intolerant impatient Went, he said, and this is what daddy said. He said, that's you. How many times could I have just gone <coughs> and wiped you off the face of the earth? But I have given you all my love. And that little boy stood there for hours. And I was just overcome for, for um, probably for about 25, 30 minutes. And from that moment, God delivered me from it, having an intolerant, nasty attitude with kids. I love kids now. Okay, these people lose their heads over a situation if they're not careful. Who lost their, lost their heads? Who lost their head? John did. So don't lose your head unnecessarily because you're intolerant. Amen? Okay, God bless you. We're going to go on tomorrow night. You want to say something to them? Pastor Josh? Tomorrow night we'll go on and then we'll get into some other stuff. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Josh. God. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Just be praying, praying, and I know we've all been blessed so much. Some of you were here. Who, who was all here the first time uh, Prophet David was here? Quite a few. All right. Some of you for the first time. So we're really blessed and um, want to make sure we sow into this right ministry. And it'll bring a great harvest in your life. And like the word has been spoken that this is harvest time. And so we'll reap what we sow. So if we want to reap a harvest, we've got to sow where there is a harvest. And so I know David is traveling all over the nations and seeing harvest. So if we sow into his life, we can expect a harvest right here. Amen. Amen. So Father, we just thank you for your equipping tonight through this vessel. We thank you, Lord God, for healing his body allowing him to get up and get moving and be here with us tonight. We thank you, Lord God, that he will have a peaceful sleep and good rest, that you'll continue to minister to him physically, and that he will be just overwhelmed with joy tomorrow morning and, and in good health. And we just thank you for that, Lord, that tomorrow night will be even an increase of your work in us through him. And so we thank you for that, Lord. And we give you all glory, God. We thank you for preparing us for such a time as this. 
And I just pray blessings upon each person that has come. And Lord, just lay on our heart what you would like us to sow into this ministry as we leave. In Jesus' name, amen.